Hello, I'm Alex Akavon, and you're listening to May It Please the Court. In any of the opinions, of course, you have words of the Constitution, like the 14th Amendment word liberty, which don't explain themselves very often in difficult cases. The question is, who decides? If you interpret a Bill of Rights so that judges can decide, oh, yes, uh, we have this empty bottle here. It's called due process of law. And we're going to say that some liberties are so important that no process will suffice to take them away. Which liberties are they? We will tell you. On the night of September 17th, 1998, just outside of Houston, Texas, a man named John Lawrence was hosting two gay acquaintances at his house. Their names were Robert and Tyrone, and they'd been dating on and off for the previous eight years. Sources say that just after 10 p.m., Robert went outside to buy a soda from the vending machine. When he returned, he caught John and Tyrone flirting with each other. Outraged, drunk, and angry, Robert stormed out of the house and called the police to warn them about a black man going crazy with a gun loose in John Lawrence's house. The police arrived within minutes. They entered the house and searched for the gunman. But instead what they found was John and Tyrone engaging in mutual homosexual sex. Racking their brains for what to do, the police arrested both men and charged them with violating the Texas anti-sodomy statute for engaging in deviant sexual conduct. But despite what a difficult night it would be for John Lawrence... It was ultimately what would give gay rights activists a new opportunity to challenge anti-sodomy statutes once again and overrule the narrow 5-4 loss in Bowers v. Hardwick. Because the United States was about to enter into a new millennium that brought a new attitude towards homosexuality and set a new stage for the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The clip you just heard was a debate between Justice Breyer and Justice Scalia. It was a debate that's been going on since the end of the Civil War. A debate at the core of the rematch for gay rights. A debate that decided the outcome of Lawrence versus Texas. The majority rules. If you don't believe in that, you don't believe in democracy. The next thing I know, these two officers were in the house. It's just all of a sudden we're taking you downtown. I was handcuffed and dragged downstairs. The larger goal was to eradicate all of the 13 sodomy laws that were now enforceable and on the books in the states in 2003. They picked the wrong person to pull this on. The single most important legal advance ever for homosexuals in America. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The facts of the Lawrence case were pretty much the exact same as the facts from Bowers v. Hardwick 17 years earlier. Both Lawrence and Hardwick had been convicted of a crime for engaging in homosexual activity. The biggest difference, really, was that that was 1986 and this was 2003. Public opinion on homosexuality had evolved considerably. In the 1990s, for example, Ellen DeGeneres had become the first mainstream sitcom star to come out both on screen and in real life as homosexual. I'm gay. The show Will and Grace, with its openly gay protagonist, had premiered on network television to glowing reviews and was in the middle of its fifth season when the Lawrence case was being decided. The reviews are in, and the critics agree the show's a snitch! But the justices themselves were still as divided as ever on the subject of substantive due process. 
Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and Chief Justice Rehnquist were still firmly against the doctrine. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor had agreed to reaffirm the core holding of Roe v. Wade in 1992, but had also voted not to apply due process to gay rights back in 1986. Meanwhile, despite being appointed by Republican President George Bush Sr., Justice Souter had comfortably established himself in the more liberal camp on this subject, along with Justice John Paul Stevens and new Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer. Roughly speaking, these differing ideologies put four justices on either side of the coin, which is why Justice Kennedy was so important. Justice Kennedy had been appointed by President Ronald Reagan, but he had not been Reagan's first choice. Reagan had initially selected Judge Bork, a hardliner, who opposed substantive due process and almost certainly would have been the fifth vote needed to reverse Roe v. Wade. But Democrats, led by then-Senator and Senate Judiciary Chairman Joe Biden, had seen to it that the Bork nomination was blocked. But Kennedy wasn't Reagan's second choice either. Reagan had next selected Douglas Ginsburg, but he ended up having to withdraw his name from consideration when it came out that he had smoked marijuana while teaching law school, an embarrassing scandal for the president who had declared the war on drugs. So Anthony Kennedy, who was a marijuana cigarette away from never becoming a Supreme Court justice, not only ended up on the bench, but also became the deciding vote on the future of the Due Process Clause and homosexual rights. Oral arguments began on March 26, 2003. Paul Smith represented John Lawrence and made almost the exact same argument that was made 17 years earlier, that the Due Process Clause should be used to recognize a right to sexual privacy. If contraception, interracial marriage, and abortion can be considered liberty that the government cannot deprive without due process of law, then so should the right to engage in homosexual activity in your house. On top of that, by 2003... Many other state laws had started to declare homosexuals as their own protected group. So one big question was whether the case could be resolved with the Equal Protection Clause, or whether the court would have to be so broad as to overrule Bowers and declare that the choice to engage in homosexual conduct was a fundamental right. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg brought this point up, and Smith was ready to push for as broad of a ruling as he could get. Mr. Smith, before you continue down to the equal protection line, your first argument was um, the right of personal privacy in one's most intimate sexual relations. You were asked, and you didn't get a chance to answer because you back on your equal protection track, you are asking the court to overrule Bowers against Hardwick. I thought that was very Yes, Your Honor. We are asking you to overrule it, and, and we think that the right of, of the fundamental right of unmarried people to make these choices about private adult consensual intimacy applies for different sex couples as well as same sex couples, and that Bowers was wrong for essentially three reasons. First, it posed the question too narrowly by fo- focusing just on homosexual sodomy, which is just one of the, the moral choices that couples ought to have, that people ought to have available to them. And second, in its analysis of history, which I think I explained already. And third, and perhaps most importantly, in the assumptions that the court made in 1986 about the realities of gay lives and gay relationships. But despite the evolving public view on homosexuality, many of the justices shared a legal philosophy that was not exactly welcoming towards Smith's arguments. Justice Scalia, however, took charge in challenging those arguments. As an originalist, he was always unlikely to interpret a fundamental right to homosexuality when the word homosexual is not in the Constitution. Plus, as it was for the majority of the court in 1986, homosexuality still seemed like a type of chosen behavior rather than a natural preference. So as Smith was getting into his groove, Scalia brought up other examples of the government regulating consensual behavior, like adultery 
probably say the same about adultery. Do you think uh, think adultery laws are unconstitutional? <coughs> I think that the state has a, a. I mean, I think people probably feel the same way about that. You know, I, I it actually, may not be a nice thing to do, but uh, I certainly don't expect to knock on the door and go to jail for it. Your Honor, adultery is a very different case. It involves the state interest in protecting the marital contract, which people voluntarily take on. Smith distinguished homosexuality from adultery and did so perhaps slightly better than his predecessors had done in the 1980s. After Smith sat down, Charles Rosenthal got up to represent the state of Texas and defend the anti-sodomy law. Now, he generally repeated similar arguments that had been successful in the Bowers case, that Texas had the right to outlaw sodomy and that the scope of the 14th Amendment should not be enlarged yet again to decide another divisive social issue. He said that Bowers v. Hardwick was still good law. But like Justice Scalia taking the road in refuting Paul Smith, Justice Breyer summed up the core of the gay rights argument and broke it down for Charles Rosenthal. The argument of, of, of Bowers to overrule Bowers is not directly related to sodomy. It's related, but not directly. It's that people in their own bedrooms uh, which uh, have their right to do basically what they want. It's not hurting other people. And they th- the, the other side says Bowers understated the importance of that. It got the history wrong. It didn't understand the relationship of the sodomy to families. And in addition, Bowers has proved to be harmful to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, if not because they're going to be prosecuted, because they fear it might they might be which makes it a possible instrument of of repression in the hands of the prosecutors. Now, that's the kind of argument that they're making. Harmful in consequence, wrong in theory, understating the constitutional value. Once oral arguments were over, the justices deliberated for three months. The Supreme Court doesn't reveal when it will decide specific cases but it does commit to deciding them before the term is over. The last day of the 2003 term was on June 26. No opinion in Lawrence v. Texas had been released yet, so everyone knew that they were saving that decision for last. You're listening May it please the court. Since the Lawrence case is so recent, we don't have as much information as to what went on during the court's deliberation. What we do know is that the justices emerged from those deliberations with passionate arguments that found their way into four separate opinions. The most important one, however, was the majority opinion. And its author was Anthony Kennedy, Reagan's third and final nomination for Lewis Powell's old seat. Kennedy's opinion found in favor of John Lawrence. By a vote of 6-3, to three, the conviction was overturned, and the Texas ban on sodomy was struck down as unconstitutional, along with every single other state law that forbid homosexual activity. It was a massive victory for the gay rights movement. Homosexuality was illegal in some states as late as 2003, until the court's decision in Lawrence v. Texas. What was also key was Kennedy's reasoning, which used the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Here is a clip of Anthony Kennedy reading out his landmark opinion. We conclude this case should be resolved by determining whether the petitioners were free as adults to engage in this private conduct and the exercise of their liberty under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And for this inquiry, we deem it necessary to uh, revisit uh, this court's uh, holding in, in Bowers. We conclude the rationale of Bowers does not withstand careful analysis. Bowers was not correct when it was decided, and it is not correct today. It ought not to remain bar- binding precedent. 
Bowers v. Hardwick should be and now is overruled. The case does involve two adults who, with full and mutual consent from each other, engage in sexual practices common to a homosexual lifestyle. The petitioners are entitled to respect for their private lives. The state cannot demean their existence or control their destiny by making their private sexual conduct a crime. Their right to liberty under the Due Process Clause gives them the full right to engage in their conduct without intervention of the government. It is the promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not enter. Kennedy not only struck the law down, but explicitly overruled Bowers and used language that was far broader than even what many gay rights activists are hoping for. Kennedy found that the fundamental right to privacy must extend to the right to sexual privacy among consenting adults. In so doing, he struck down any law that forbids sodomy. But Justice Kennedy also made a point to respond to the criticisms that he knew would come. He knew that other justices would complain that the 14th Amendment's language does not discuss privacy. But he explained that society evolves, and that it was indeed the court's place to recognize violations of our constitutional principles and interfere to stop them. Had those who drew and ratified the due process clauses of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment known the components of liberty in its manifold possibilities, they might have been more specific. They did not presume to have this insight. They knew times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper in fact serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. Kennedy was the fifth vote needed to overturn sodomy laws. But the final vote was six to three. So who was the sixth? It definitely wasn't going to be Thomas Scalia or Wenquist. It was Sandra Day O'Connor. But what Sandra Day O'Connor did was very interesting. She did not agree that substantive due process should be used to protect gay rights. She did not recognize such a constitutional right so broadly. After all, she was part of the original Bowers v. Hardwick majority that explicitly declared that there is no fundamental right to engage in sodomy. So once again, using the concept of stare decisis and deferring to the wisdom of the Bowers court on which she sat, O'Connor wrote her own opinion, distinct from Justice Kennedy's. Because even though she opposed using the due process clause, Justice O'Connor did not like that Texas was forbidding homosexual men from engaging in sodomy, but didn't apply the law the same way to heterosexuals and women. To her, this was an equal protection issue. But legally speaking, even today, sexual orientation is not as strictly scrutinized as race-based discrimination. So her arguments did at least suggest that homosexuals should be afforded more protection. But she made it clear that the state could still prohibit things like same-sex marriage as long as gay men and lesbian women were equally banned from getting married. So basically, Justice O'Connor agreed to strike down the anti-sodomy law, but did so for her own, far more narrow reasons. Meanwhile, Justice Scalia was not having any of it. He emphatically wrote and delivered the court's official dissent, refuting all the justices in the majority. He accused them of signing on to the homosexual agenda and cautioned his readers about the Pandora's box that will result from the court's decision. He pointed out that the broad rights granted to homosexuals would inevitably be used to challenge bans on same-sex marriage, no matter what Justice O'Connor thinks about the issue. But no one can illustrate his fervor better than the man himself, so here is a clip of Scalia announcing his dissent in Lawrence versus Texas. At the end of its opinion, the court says that the present case, quote, does not involve whether the government must give formal recognition to any relationship that homosexual persons may seek to enter, close quote. Do not believe it. Today's opinion dismantles the structure of constitutional law 
that has permitted a distinction to be made between heterosexual and homosexual unions. But beneath all of Scalia's vehement opposition to the court's ultimate holding was an impassionate argument against substantive due process. Not unlike the justices who came long before him, Justice Scalia took serious issue with using the Due Process Clause to guarantee fundamental rights that it is up to the justices to determine. So most of Scalia's argument appealed to democratic principles. To him, it was not about whether he agreed or disagreed with homosexuality. It was about what the people of Texas had voted on. From contraception to abortion to homosexuality, Justice Scalia's position was that if the people want those things to be legal, they should vote for them. And if they want the Constitution to protect those things, along with a right to privacy, then someone should propose a constitutional amendment that specifically addresses those issues. Let me be clear that I have nothing against homosexuals or any other group promoting their agenda through through normal democratic means. Social perceptions of sexual and other morality change over time, and every group has the right to persuade its fellow citizens that its view of such matters is best. That homosexuals have achieved some success in that enterprise is attested to by the fact that Texas is one of the few remaining states that criminalize consensual homosexual acts. But persuading one's fellow citizens is one thing, and imposing one's views in absence of democratic majority will is something else. What Texas has chosen to do is well within the range of traditional democratic action, and its hand should not be stayed through the invention of a brand new constitutional right by a court that is impatient of democratic change. Scalia was joined by Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Thomas. Thomas also wrote his own short opinion, where he referenced a quote from Justice Potter Stewart's dissent back in the Griswold v. Connecticut case. Justice Stewart had bluntly called the anti-contraception law at issue uncommonly silly, but he had also determined that it was Connecticut's right to pass such a silly law. Thomas used that quote to call the anti-sodomy statute uncommonly silly but he agreed that it was not for the court to decide the issue. Of all the justices from the 1960s to the present day, Clarence Thomas is probably the one who most consistently rejects substantive due process. Most justices who oppose a doctrine seek to limit its expansion while not quite reversing the court's prior decisions. But Justice Thomas would be perfectly happy to get rid of the entire line of cases that stemmed from the 14th Amendment's so-called right to privacy. On a philosophical level, Justice Kennedy sees the Constitution as a living, breathing document that outlines a set of principles, values, and procedures which are applied to the modern world by modern judges. To justices like Kennedy and Breyer, The wisdom of the Constitution comes from its ability to adapt and be interpreted over time as new situations arise. But Justice Scalia had an entirely different approach. To Scalia, the Constitution is made of words that had a specific meaning attributed to them at the time they were written. And he criticized the court for reading words into the Constitution that are not there which is pretty much exactly what FDR had been complaining about in 1937. But the issues back then had been economic, and by the time Justice Scalia had joined the court, they were far more personal. But ultimately, these fundamentally different approaches would earn Scalia a reputation for hindering social progress, while Kennedy would be championed as a key figure in the gay rights movement. Still, Kennedy's biggest moment had not yet arrived. Justice Scalia had predicted that the court's decision in Lawrence would one day lead to striking down same-sex marriage bans. The Anthony Kennedy of 2003 might not have thought so, 
But what would he say in 2015? The next decade would see the invention of the iPhone, the rise of social media, and a new legal question about whether same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marry. Join us next week for the season finale of May It Please the Court as we discuss same-sex marriage and the case of Obergefell v. Hodges when our due process story comes to an end. May It Please the Court is produced by Untwist the Facts. Visit our website at www.untwistthefacts.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Untwist the Facts. I'm Alex Akavon, and thank you so much for listening.